straight ahead on Falcon Weekly. The cold weather, weather is coming. Winter weather is being felt across much of the south. We'll take a look at how it will impact Montevallo's forecast. And this year's College Night is a DV. We'll have a live in-studio interview with Goldside leader Madison Inbush. Plus, Auburn welcomes the return of oak trees to Tumor's Corner. But they can't start rolling the trees just yet. Find out how long fans will have to wait to roll the new oaks. And your Netflix binge watching habits might be a bad sign. Find out what a new health study says about marathoning your favorite shows. Falcon Weekly starts now. Hello and welcome to Falcon Weekly. I'm Hannah Bell. And I'm Kirsten Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. We start this week with winter weather. While many, excuse me, while many northeastern states are still covered in record-breaking snow, the Midwest and Southeast are preparing for their own mix of sleet, snow, and extremely cold temperatures. Reporter Paulo Sandoval shows us how these winter storms are affecting the southeast. Still snow covered northeast. Meteorologists predict the new winter storm could stretch across the Midwest and southeast. People in parts of Kentucky, Arkansas, and Missouri already being hit with freezing rain, snow, and ice. Dangerously cold temperatures adding to miserable conditions. North Carolina's governor declaring a state of emergency ahead of the storm. Our goal again, like last year, is to be overprepared and hopefully underwhelmed by this storm. The travel forecast also looks bleak. FlightAware.com reporting thousands of flight cancellations and delays from coast to coast. Travelers in Tennessee and North Carolina airports feeling the brunt of the travel trouble, and those on the roads are feeling it too. I'm trying to get home. I just had a blowout on the freeway, but I was able to pull in here. The wicked weather comes as Boston's brutal winter makes its way into record books. The city reached its snowiest month yet, with nearly five feet this month alone, the most since record keeping started in 1872. I've been struck over the last couple of days how Boston Bostonians have pulled together. Uh, here uh, in the neighborhoods. I've spent a lot of time driving around the different neighborhoods and, and seeing folks uh, shoveling, out their sh shoveling out their houses, shoveling out their neighbors, helping people. With more snow on the way, the extreme winter weather just doesn't seem to quit. I'm Bolo Sandoval reporting. Forecasts has called for the possibility of ice accumulation across central Alabama, which forced the university to delay the start of class by two hours this morning. In a statement released Monday afternoon, UM says it plans to open at 8 a.m. Tuesday morning, but the administration is monitoring weather conditions. Now let's head outside to Falcon Weekly's Jacob Bopes for the look at this week's weather. Hey, Jacob. Thanks, guys. I know the quest big question on everyone's mind today is snow, snow, snow? And I'm afraid today, at least, the answer is no. As the week goes on, there's going to be a chance of the white stuff, but for the most part, it's just been another dreary day here in Montevallo. Cold, wind, rain, <laughs> been no fun for anyone. And it's not going to get much better as the week goes on. Though there will be a few small chances of snow. But for tonight, expect a low of 26 and the rain to continue, or even get worse as the night goes on. Though it should clear up by morning. Now, tomorrow there is a very small chance of flurries. Not very big, but the chance is there in the evening, not during the day. It'll probably just turn into drizzle, but hey, a chance is a chance. On Wednesday, though, there's a very good chance of snow, or at least better, about 20%. High 45, low 26, and a chance of flurries all day. It's probably gonna be a miserable day if it doesn't snow, but hey. Thursday, Friday, both days are gonna be pretty cold, but no real precip pre precipitation to speak of. Now, Saturday and Sunday, it's rain, rainy and cold. No chance of snow either. Sadly, it's gonna be a fairly miserable weekend to top off a fairly miserable week. But for a moment, let's change our focus from snow to thunderstorms. It's the National Weather Service's Severe Weather Awareness Week, and today's focus is the T-storm itself. Now, we all know what a thunderstorm is, or at least have a really good idea, but there's some important safety tips you need to know. The first and most important is 
If there's a thunderstorm, get inside. And I mean it. Get inside, away from windows, away from electronic devices. Better yet, unplug your electronic devices. That way they don't short out. And just stay there. No emergency is worth risking your life. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to get caught in a thunderstorm, get inside. Or at least find somewhere where the elements are minimized a bit. It's a really dangerous situation that's no laughing matter. We aren't going to have any thunderstorms this week, or at least I hope we won't. But it's still important to know these important safety tips. Anyway, back to you guys. Thanks, Jacob. To keep up to date about the changing winter weather forecast, be sure to like the National Weather Service Birmingham page on Facebook. Countless UM alumni returned to campus for last week's annual college night competition. The showdown between the Golds and the Purples ended Saturday night after both sides' final performances. And there were a few tense moments while everyone waited to find out whether this year it was going to be a PV or a GV. site leader Madison Inbush. Madison, thanks so much for joining us. What was it like in that moment when it was announced that it was a GV? It was very surreal, very exciting. Um, it really almost was too good to be true. It was, it was hard to believe that the moment was real. It was wonderful. Um, next, what was it like when, for you personally, like that moment where all your accomplished, all your hard work had paid off, like how do you personally feel about that? That seriously was amazing because, well, we've really been planning for, I mean, I feel like a year, but since summer, we started planning our cabinet. And then, uh, but then since the day we got back to school on, we've been working uh, just so, so many hours, just um, just so much to my time. And to think that that just paid off and was worth it, it was such a good feeling. Um, we were talking before the show about, like, you don't, you don't cry, you're not an emotional person. So what did you actually do? when it was announced. I fell on the ground. <laughs> I fell on the ground and I looked up and I saw my co-leader and I grabbed him and we hugged. And then I looked down and I saw the director who wrote the show last year as well and directed the show last year. And she wrote this show and I saw her on the ground sobbing and I just, I leaned down and I hugged her. Now you had a co-partner, a co mm -hmm. partner, uh, Stacy. Yes. Um, so you guys definitely had to make a, a good bond together to be able to like run everything and work. How does it feel to, to ha in that moment experience it with somebody that you spent so much time with. It was really neat because I feel like at that point nobody nobody else knows like what you go through and what we went through together except for us. So it was very, very special and it was really neat and I was very thankful to work with him because we balanced each other out perfectly. Like he was good at the things I wasn't and I was good at the things he wasn't. And I was very thankful for him. Um, and lastly, of course all of us who have experienced college night, we know that it's hard juggling school and college night and trying to manage. And you had a, a lot more stress than you know some people who were like in the shows. Like you had to kind of be there for everything. So how did you manage school and college night? Well, um, I didn't manage the school as well as I should have. <laughs> Let's just say that. But I'm planning to really catch up from now on. Um, a lot of my time, even you know, work early into the morning, and even during the day somebody would need something or we or have to go run errands or we were hanging flies or something. A lot of my time during the day was used to and then I was very tired on top of that. But I'm planning to catch up and work really hard. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations on thank a GV you. and we can't wait to see what happens next year. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. In other College Night news, the university took time to celebrate the opening of the 3D Art Building. Talking with Please Umar Nadar joins us live in the studio for a look at Saturday's ribbon cutting ceremony. Hey, Umar. Hi, Kirsten. While things were being set up for the days of ribbon cutting at the 3D Art Building, Gary Walton of Thomas Batson Architects expressed his gratitude for the opportunity to work on this project. Very honored and very proud to be a part of this project with the University of Montevallo great folks to work with and we're very excited for them. As the ceremony began, mm -hmm. Dr. Stewart turned to thank 
Barbara Blackerby, as well as her husband, Conrad, who was not present for the ribbon cutting. We are deeply, deeply grateful for your generosity and for you coming home to celebrate homecoming with us this weekend. And just can't uh, think of a better way to honor your time here. We love you. Ready? As guests entered the 3D building to preview the facility, Dr. Scott Meyer was very proud. I think what we saw is everybody that had something to do with the creation of the building. So uh, there was everybody up here from administration. We had architect in the audience. We had people that physically did it. And uh, it's really gratifying to see everybody here at one time. During the ceremony, Dean of the College of Fine Arts, Steve Peters quoted Ernest Boyer, president of the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching, quoting, no education is complete without arts. Reporting live in the studio, I'm Umar Nadir. A Madison police officer is being charged with assault after a 911 call led to a 57-year-old man being hospitalized during his visit with his family. Dash cam footage has been released by the Madison Police Department. Christine Kilimar has the story. The non-emergency call came into the Madison Police Department early Friday morning. The caller was on his way to work when he saw a man wandering around his neighborhood. He's a skinny black guy. He's got a toboggan on. Uh, he's really skinny. I, I've lived here for four years. I've never seen him before. The caller said the man looked to be in his 30s and had done the same thing the day before. He was nervous leaving his wife at home and asked for someone to talk to the man. We now know that man to be 57-year-old Surisby Patel, who was in the neighborhood to visit his son and new grandson. Dispatch sent field training officer Eric Parker and trainee Andrew Slaughter to check it out. He was walking in the yard, standing by the driveways and looking around the garages. Dash cam from Parker's vehicle shows the two officers approach Patel just after 8 a.m. Parker asks Patel where he is going. Stop walking. Stop walking. Do you have any ID on you? No ID. What's your name? He's saying no English. He doesn't understand. Parker then asks Patel if he lives in the neighborhood. As he does, Patel begins to walk away. Do not jerk away from me again. If you do, I'm going to put you on this ground. Do not jerk away from me one more time. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do not jerk away from me again. As this is going on, a third officer pulls up, and his dash cam shows that Patel is then taken Stop. to the ground. Trying to jerk away. Stop trying to jerk away from me. After they pat Patel down, the officers try to make him stand as his body collapses beneath him. Patel remains hospitalized and partially paralyzed since that day. That was Christine Kilimaya reporting. Over the weekend, India's Council General traveled to Madison to speak with the mayor to try to prevent this from happening again in the future. Gay couples in Alabama cannot be refused a marriage license from any of the state's probate, probate judges. This was the ruling of a federal judge last Thursday. The ruling was made after Alabama's Chief Justice Roy Moore ordered the state's probate judges not to issue licenses to same-sex couples. State Representative Barry Moore says the federal courts have not taken all of Alabama's thoughts into consideration, but openly gay State Representative Pat Patricia Todd says Alabamians need to accept the ruling. The fact that the, uh, the judge has made this ruling and is really overturning the will of the people is a concern for us, and I think we'll have to look at some laws possibly to just get the state of Alabama out of the marriage business. I think that's totally unrealistic. Um, this is going to be the law of the land. We have to comply. People will adjust to it in a year or two. They'll look back on this and think, well, that was no big deal. It didn't really affect me one way or another. The U.S. Supreme Court is expected to rule on the constitutionality of same-sex marriage later this year. In other news around Alabama, two new oak trees officially joined Auburn University's famed Tumors Corner on Saturday. They are replacing two of the iconic oaks that were on the campus that were destroyed by an angry rival football fan, Harvey Updike. 
Hundreds of, hundreds of Auburn students and fans gathered to welcome the return of the campus landmarks. They look beautiful and they're young, so they're little, so we know they're going to be here for a long time. And whenever we come back as alumni, they're going to be here. School officials reviewed over 9,000 trees before picking the 15-year-old replacement tree. It's an Auburn tradition to celebrate a football win by covering the trees in toilet paper. Fam fans must wait until 2016 football season to continue the tradition because the new trees must be allowed to acclimate to their new home. Remember, there's more news online 24-7. Just search for UM Falcon Weekly on Facebook and Twitter to see more stories and news updates throughout the week. Do you find yourself watching an entire season of your favorite show in just a few days? Binge watching has, an, in, has increased over the last decade with TV streaming providers. Coming up, find how binge watching may be a sign of poor mental health. Plus, a dramatic finish for one Texas marathon runner. Find out why this, run, why this runner crawled across the finish line. And Oscar nominee Benedict Cumberbatch has a Valentine's Day that he'll never forget. See what made the romantic day so special. Those stories and more when Falcon Weekly returns. In national news, the death toll related to last year's GM ignition switch recall continues to rise. According to the new report from the Wall Street Jump, Journal, the number of deaths being blamed on the faulty ignition switch is now at 56. That's how many will be eligible for a payout. According to GM, over 1,300 other claims are still under review. American sniper Kyle, Chris Kyle's murder trial continues in Texas. Eddie Routh is accused of killing Kyle and Chad Last Littlesfield in 2013 at a Texas shooting range. Among those taking the witnesses stand today was the officer who took Ralph to the county jail after his arrest. The boots Ralph wore on the day of the shooting were presented at the trial. Ralph's lawyer said the client killed Kyle and Littlefield, but claims that he was insane at the time. A community in North Carolina is still mourning after three Muslim students were killed. On Saturday, hundreds of people in Riley paid their respects to the UNC students at the public memorial. The students were sh who were all shot and killed by a neighbor last Tuesday. A counselor from the Turkey ambassador em Embassy was sent to Riley with a message of condolence. The families say the outpouring of support is helping them through this difficult time. Looking ahead to the 2016 presidential election, Jeb Bush has received the OK to run for president from an important family member. Former First Lady Barbara Bush expressed her support for her son through a Skype interview at the Legacy Charity event Friday night. Uh, in 2013, the former First Lady told NBC's Matt Lauer that America has had enough of the Bushes in the White House. Now, Mrs. Bush says she has changed her mind. She says that as long as Jeb can help the country, she wants him to run for office. A dire warning from NASA. The organization says that parts of the U.S. could be on the verge of what they call a mega drought. NASA says that by the end of the century, the West Coast could be in for a drought that has the potential to last for several decades. NASA also says the drought conditions will be drier and last longer than any other droughts in U.S. history over the last thousand years. Officials say global warming is to blame. The most memorable moment of Sunday's Austin Marathon came as one woman crossed the finish line on her hands and knees. Kenya runner Heaven Natek led the race, but her body gave out and she collapsed with only two kilometers left. When the nurse offered her a wheelchair, she declined so she could finish the race herself. So she crawled to the finish line, earning her third place in the women's division. Acclaimed actor Benedict Cumberbatch tied the knot with his Valentine this, on this Valentine's Day as pop star Selena Gomez gears up for her next release. Reporter Jeremy Roth has these stories and more in this week's Hollywood Minute.
Benedict Cumberbatch is off the market. The actor married fiance Sophie Hunter Saturday in the UK. The two were engaged in November and are expecting their first child together. And next week in May Cap, a great month for Cumberbatch. He's nominated for Best Actor at this year's Oscars for his role in The Imitation Game. Selena Gomez is gearing up to release a new single. The song is called I Want You to Know and is a collaboration with producer Zed. The two have been hyping the single on the internet, posting cover art to their social media pages. The song releases February 23rd. I'm incapable of leaving you alone. Symptoms. Fifty Shades of Grey dominated the box office this weekend, bringing in more than $81 million. Kingsman, The Secret Service, trailed behind at number two, grossing more than $35 million. And the SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water, rounded out the top three. It made more than $30 million. The Hollywood Minute, I'm Jeremy Roth. In health news, troubling news for TV fans. If you love binge watching your favorite shows, it could be a sign of depression. Reporter John Voss has more on a new health study you should be aware of before your next marathon viewing session. So, do you want to watch the entire new season of House of Cards later this month? I knew you shouldn't trust that woman. I didn't. I don't. I don't trust anyone. Well, how about all 62 episodes of Breaking Bad at once? I think we need to talk about it. doubling down. Then you doubling are down. a binge watcher. I have to get up early for work, so let's get in our PJs, and then we'll watch one more. Okay, but... one more. So good. How is it so good? What time is it? It's like daylight already. Laughed at on shows like Portlandia, binge watching defined as watching multiple episodes of a TV program in rapid succession has become part of pop culture. And with thousands of shows from Game of Thrones to Downton Abbey available any time, all the time on streaming services like Netflix and Hulu, binge watching is booming. A recent survey from TiVo claims more than 90% of viewers binge watch their favorite shows. Even former President Bill Clinton reportedly watched the entire first season of House of Cards in just a few days. Power is a lot like real estate. It's all about location, location, location. But a new study from the University of Texas in Austin suggests binge watching could be a sign of a serious health issue, namely depression. While researchers are not claiming binge watching makes you depressed, they say the more lonely and depressed participants in their study were more likely to binge watch TV. So before you spend the weekend catching up on Mad Men, Perhaps the best advice is to watch in moderation. I just can't. John Vores, CNN. If you think you're dealing with depression, UM's Counseling Service Office is here to help. Their office is located in the lower level of Main Hall, and they are open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you need to set up an appointment, you can walk in or call 665-6245. Going out to eat is common nowadays. On average, Americans are eating out five times a week. But eating out isn't always healthy. We have some tips that will help make eating choices healthier. Here's Holly Ferfer with the story. Dr. Andrew Weil has been an advocate for healthy eating since the 1970s. I think you really have to have some strategies. Dr. Weil has some tips for eating out. You know, first of all, one good trick is to tell waiters not to bring bread and butter before the meal is served. First of all, the quality of bread in most restaurants is terrible. And you can fill up on a lot of calories before you even eat the food. So why even have that on the table? Another is to ask for dressings and sauces on the side. You want to avoid fried things. You know, one thing is to ask restaurants for olive oil instead of butter, which is a healthier fat. And you don't have to say, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. Watch the portion control. If the meal is too big, order a half portion, share it with someone, or ask for half to go. Dr. Weil adds, if you want to splurge on dessert, go ahead and order something, but share it with the whole table. Food is a major influence on health, but it's also, it's a major source of pleasure. I think the big challenge is for people to experience that food that is good for you can also be food that's delicious. For today's Health Minute, I'm Holly Furfer. Up next, UM baseball team walks away with a big win over Albany State. Plus, the men's and women's track and field team made a strong showing at the Sanford Invitational. 
see how UM ranked in individual events. Sports is next. Welcome back to Falcon Weekly. I'm Mary-Kate McCarrick with a look at this week's sports. The UM baseball team ended the final game of the Montevallo Baseball Classic with a 19-7 win over Albany State. UM's 19 runs are the most runs in a game in three years. The Falcons' next game on February 18th against Stillman College will be rescheduled to a later date due to possible bad weather. Visit MontevalloFalcons.com for the latest information on the rescheduling of this game. Meanwhile, the women's softball team had a win and a loss in their first two games of the Cougar Classic. In the first game, the Falcons came back from a losing first inning to defeat the Belmont Abbey Crusaders 13-5. The Falcons dropped the second game to Lincoln Memorial at 8-7. UM fought back, scoring three runs in the ninth inning, but came short of the win. On day two of the Cougar Classic, UM dropped the pair, losing to Tusculum 11-3 and to Florida Tech 8-0. The men's and women's track and field teams had a strong showing at the Sanford Invitational on February 13th and 14th. Eleven members ranked in the top 25 in individual events. Seven members of the men's team ranked in the top 25 and four members of the women's team also had top 25 finishes. For the complete list of results, search UM Falcon Weekly on Facebook. The University of Montevallo's men and women's basketball teams played in the Peach Conference this past week. The women's basketball team lost to Columbus State University at 68-37. The men's basketball team beat Clayton State 77-61. The men have won 14 of their six, last 16 games, keeping them in the first place in the PBC. Reporting for Falcon Weekly, I'm Mary-Kate McCarrick. Thanks, Mary-Kate. Finally this week, couples in New York got to say I do with, their, with a view on Valentine's Day. 100 couples got married or renewed their vows on top of the Empire State Building. February 14th is the only day of the year couples can wed atop the iconic building. For the first time, any couple with a New York State marriage license was able to sign up to marry on the 86th floor observatory. Usually, a contest is held and just a handful of lovebirds are selected to wed atop the legendary skyscraper. That's all the time we have for this week's show. Thank you so much for joining us. For more UM news for MassCom student reporters, be sure to check out Falcon News Network blog. The web address is on your screen. We'll see you next week.